Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim from uh, Morial TV and Morial Radio here with James Jacob Prash live via Skype. Jacob, one of the believers had the question based on uh, the book of Esther, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Did Esther do the right thing by participating in a pagan beauty contest and becoming a part of Xerxes' harem? First of all, she was part of a captive people who were taken captive by the Babylonians and semi-liberated by the Persians, who were benevolent to the Jews. As far as being in the harem, she didn't have a lot of choice. She didn't have a lot of choice. It was the Lord who got her out of the harem and elevated her. Now, there's a typology in this we explain on our teaching on the Book of Esther. Even in rabbinic thought, ancient rabbinic thought, while most types or shadows of the Messiah to come are men, Esther is an exception. She brought redemption. It uses the term redemption in Hebrew to the people. And she went from a place of captivity to a place of exaltation in a single day because of the will of the king. Again, there's a typology in the book of Esther. Much typology. The description of the ancient Persian court in the first chapter of the book of Esther uh, from a literary perspective, is employed by the book of Revelation. It's used in the book of Revelation to portray the celestial court in heaven, and so forth. Let's put those things aside while bearing them in mind. Esther had no choice whatsoever. All of the young maidens were gathered into the harem to see who would please the king. She had no choice in the matter. Uh, Again, she was a subject of the emperor, and in those days there was no democracy. Although the Jews had a better position and situation under the Persians than they did under the Babylonians, they were still not a free people as such. Secondly, as far as the beauty contest, there is nothing in the text indicating that it involved any kind of pagan worship or sacrifice, nothing. It was simply a beauty contest to replace Queen Vashti. And again, there's a typology in this with the two women, which we explain on the Esther tapes. Is it wrong for a Christian today to be in a beauty pageant? Well, there was not long ago, as we know, I think it was a Miss America or a Miss Universe, who was a Christian, extremely pretty young lady, but a committed Christian. And because of her position on same-sex marriage and regarding homosexuality and lesbianism, she was disqualified or removed even though she'd won the contest fairly and squarely. Now that gave her an opportunity in the public eye to give testimony to her faith, to give glory to the Lord, and to express the reasons for her faith-based moral convictions concerning sexuality and homosexuality. Had she not been in that position, had she not been in the beauty contest, that wouldn't have happened. God made use of it. Was she right or wrong to enter the beauty contest to begin with? That's between her and the Lord. I don't know. But once she was in it, God used her in it. I'm not saying it was God's will for her, perfect will, or it wasn't. That's not for me to say. But it had nothing to do with idolatry or pagan worship. It was simply a secular thing, a thing of the world. We are called to be in the world, but not of it. So too it was Esther. There's no indication it was anything other than a purely secular venture that did not involve pagan worship. We must not read into the text things it does not say. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our 
Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube, deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo. What the scripture actually teaches about the rapture. The snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo. All available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.